So if I, you're my pastor, I look at you and I go, I trust you, Joshua. So we have this complicated world. What should we do? A really good leader who knows that they can't rely on trust says the three hardest words for anybody to say. I don't know. And I'm inviting you to come with me on a journey of learning. We're going to figure it out together. Hello, and welcome to the Shifting Culture podcast in which we have conversations about the culture we create and the impact we can make. We long to see the body of Christ look like Jesus. I'm your host, Joshua Johnson. Our show is powered by you, the listener. If you want to support the work that we do, get early access to episodes, episode guides, and more, go to patreon.com slash shifting culture to become a monthly patron so that we can continue in this important work. And don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app to be notified when new episodes come out each week and go leave a rating and review. It's easy. It only takes a second and it helps us find new listeners to the show. Just go to the show page on the app that you're using right now and hit five stars. It really is that easy. Thank you so much. You know what else would help us out? Share this podcast with your friends, your family, your network. Tell them how much you enjoy it and let them know that they should be listening as well. If you're new here, welcome. If you want to dig deeper, find us on social media at Shifting Culture Podcast, where I post video clips and quotes and interact with all of you. Previous guests on the show have included Carl Martin, Ed Curie, and David Taylor. You can go back and listen to those episodes and more. But today's guest is Todd Bolsinger. So excited to have Todd back on the podcast. He's the founder and principal at A.E. Sloan Leadership, Inc., the executive director of the Dupree Center Church Leadership Institute and associate professor of leadership formation at Fuller Seminary. He is the author of Canoeing the Mountains and Tempered Resilience. His latest books are the Practicing Change series. Todd and his wife, Beth, split their time between Pasadena, California, and Ketchum, Idaho. In this conversation, Todd Bolsinger provides a thoughtful exploration of the challenges and opportunities facing leaders in a rapidly changing world. He shares insights on the importance of adaptability, humility, and a willingness to learn and experiment in the face of crisis and uncertainty. He discusses the need for leaders to shift their values and attitudes and behaviors to effectively navigate change while also centering marginalized voices and maintaining a focus on the core mission. We cover topics such as the role of trust and transformation in leadership, the evolving nature of discipleship, and the importance of crafting a clear and concise mission. Overall, this conversation offers valuable guidance for leaders seeking to lead their organizations and communities through times of profound change. Here is my conversation with Todd Balsinger. Todd, welcome back to Shifting Culture. Really excited to have you on again. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. Always a nice thing to return. Yeah. Yes, it's good. I, I actually want to start here. So in a month, I get to do something I look forward to all year long is I, I get to go to Northern Idaho, spend a few days on the river and fly fish. Uh, that's, that's the thing I look forward to. I get to quiet my mind. I get to be on the river. I know you are a fly fishing guy. What does fly fishing do for you and do for your leadership as you're coaching people through adaptive change and leading? What is fly fishing? Now, that's such a great, great thing. And Northern, I say, the problem is I can use up the rest of our time just asking me, asking you questions about where you are. So I'm in central Idaho on the Big Wood River most of the time or at Silver Creek. What fly fishing does for me it, that is so interesting, as you know, this is when you have to focus your attention on something you can barely see, right? So a dry fly on a rippled river with the sun going, what it does is it actually makes everything else go away. And what I started realizing was I needed that both to calm my mind and to focus my mind and in a world where I feel like I'm scrolling and streaming and got lots of people in my ears. I mean, you know this, if, if my phone buzzes in my pocket when I've got a fish going up to do the take, I'll miss the fish So because it'll distract me. So it is the most um, zen-like, <laughs> like focused, relaxed experience I tell people for me, it is water yoga. Like it's like, like I'm in the, I'm in the middle in a beautiful stream. And also I'm usually in a beautiful place. And so there's 
you know, all the neurons in my body are just, you know, my brain and all the cells and everything in my body is just taking a big deep breath and taking it all in. Yeah, I agree. It's just something uh, I look forward to it every year. It's like I have to have it uh, and I have to just uh, sit and relax and focus and clear everything out. Um, and it rejuvenates me for the next thing. You know, it was uh, two years ago you came on, so it's been two years. What's what what's been a major theme in the last couple of years that we've seen? You know, so that was 2022. Pandemic started 2020. Everybody's been hit with change. They're they're seeing it now as people are starting to realize, oh, this isn't going away. Like the change is here to stay. What are some themes that have been popping for you? Well, you know, so Joshua, one of the most powerful things that have been popping is the more that I have talked with leaders about change and the more that I've engaged, I have been completely encouraged and I've been impressed. There are just a number of really, really gifted, good leaders who were humble enough to say, okay, what we used to do didn't work. And even though there's a lot of people who want to go back to, you know, back to what we did, I'm not sure what we did did what we thought it did. <laughs> so that open kind of humility that I've seen in leaders um, has led me and the folks in our co- company who do a bunch of coaching to start asking questions about what are the trends we see in good leaders and how can we support them? And so I ended up writing these four little books, practicing change books around, um, we call them the four big mistakes that good leaders make. And they're, they're big mistakes because um, they make a big difference. They're, it's not, but they are, but they're always mistakes that really good leaders are making. And and one of the things they learned during the COVID and the post COVID years and the changing world is that these that the best leaders sometimes fall into these traps. And so that's what we've been working on a lot of is helping some really really gifted people from all over the world to work on being better leaders. And, and this is what's amazing. I, I'm just there. I admire their humility and their openness. So then, if we're we're looking at some of these common mistakes and these things that we fall into, these traps. Uh, the first book, little book in the series is How Not to Waste a Crisis. Uh, the subtitle is Quit Trying Harder. What What's the mistake that, that people make in the midst of a crisis? Well, so, so in one sense to say it is they don't go fly fishing enough. Right? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, what they do is um, really good leaders. This is one thing I learned the best leaders are hard workers and what they the mistake they make is thinking they can outwork massive change like you try to outwork these problems and so what they do is and they're inspiring right this is why we follow these folks and this is why they ended up in senior leadership is these are people who like have good integrity and great character and they double down on working really hard and the problem is is when you try harder you tend to default back to what got you here. So you try harder at the thing that you're good at. And usually that means you have to learn something new that you're not so good at. And so you can't keep trying harder. You actually have to retrain and you have to see the problem differently. So what does it look like then to see it with clarity and see the problem differently and not just fall back on what you've known in the past? Yeah. So I would say like if you, one of the questions I ask leaders all the time is, so what is your leadership superpower? And they all giggle like, oh, come on, knock it off. I mean, no, no, no. What's the thing you go to? What's your go-to? Like you wake up in the middle of the night and there's a problem. What do you do? I mean, you can imagine mine is talking. Like I'm a good talker. Like I, I can speak. I can, I, I just said, you, you give me one question. I can get a three point sermon pretty easily. You give me one crisis. I can get a six week series, <laughs> you know, right? Like, because I'm good at talking. So what do I do when there's a problem? I try to talk it to them. But what one of my buddies said to me, you know, Todd, you and I are the kind of guys who are so good at talking about stuff. After a while, we think we've actually done it. And, um, and part of what we're trying to do is say to people, okay, there's a different thing to do at that moment. When you, when you have a problem in front of you, instead of immediately defaulting to your training, here's the phrase, see the shift before you solve the problem see the shift and that's adaptive language that's adaptive language that we talked about in canoeing the mountains and temporary resilience like um, adaptive leadership is when you can't use your best practices and you have to make a shift of values attitudes or behaviors so if all of a sudden in your head you go 
oh, I got to see the shift. My behavior is to want to talk this thing to death or organize this thing to death or create a spreadsheet or, or, or fire everybody and hire everybody new, whatever it is. Instead, shift my behavior and what do I see now? Or shift my attitude and what do I see now? Or even, even more tender is shift my values. And this is always takes discernment. What are the values I won't? What are the values I won't dare give up? Because if I do, I lose my soul. But what are the values that I that I love, but I might have to give up in order for us to keep going? That's now we're in a different terrain. All Nations Kansas City has two exciting events with Jamie and Donna Winship coming up. Join us on September 13th for our annual fundraiser, Further Together, with Jamie and Donna as our main speakers. Did you know that God is on the move all around the world? You will hear stories about people receiving their true identity from God and impacting nations. And you will be invited to join us so that more stories like these can happen and we can see peace in the midst of conflict. The following day, September 14th, Jamie and Donna will be doing their Identity Exchange Workshop. Join us to discover your true identity and experience a life of joy, peace, and freedom. You can register for both events at allnations.us. Can you give me an example of of somebody that you have you have coached or or taught in one of your cohorts where they they started to see a shift? What kind of a shift was it? And where was the value change for them? And how did they they move into a different direction? Yeah. So as I love telling this story. One of my clients I've been working with for three years. I still I'm still working with him. He's the senior pastor of a church in a, a southern city where the demographics have been shifted. So talk about the changing environment. They've gone from being a their, their area is instead of being a dominantly white homogeneous area has now become a very multi ethnic multiplex. It is way more complicated. Well, his deepest value, the value of the church, is to be missional. We are going to love our neighbors. And so so today, they are a multi-ethnic church that is exploring as deeply as possible what it means to love neighbors. Some of them are people who are new immigrants to the community, in the city. Some of them are people who moved here. What does it mean for us to be a church that reaches those neighbors? There are 2,000 members, and they're one of the most multi-ethnic churches I've ever seen. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. He, he only has one problem, and his problem is, is that he preaches to 500 empty seats every week because they used to be 5,000 members. There was a time when the area was homogeneous, that they were a commuter megachurch, and the big shift that they had to shift was, as soon as we say our deepest value is to be, is to be missional and to reach our neighbors, we need to make shifts for our neighbors which meant they lost a number of the commuters. So instead of being a 5,000-member church on the way to being 10,000 as they thought they were going to be, they're actually a 2,000-member church having to reshape people into what does it mean to love your neighbor when your neighbor is different than you. And that's a, I mean, that's a deep thing to, to acknowledge. It's, it's even a painful thing to say, right? Because um, it, all of a sudden, there's all these underlying things we have to, have to address, and they're doing it. So in the midst of change, how do you stay true to your values when something like that will happen? 5,000 to 2,000. You're going to have to lay off staff. You're going to have to have people, you know, not be be there. Some people will be angry at you. There's all sorts of <laughs> difficult things when you lose 3,000 people, but you're yeah. staying true to your value. How do you hold on to that value in the midst of change so that... Yes, this good thing that we're doing is worth it, even though numbers are dwindling. Yeah, so this is actually one of the other books. So uh, the book, there's a book called "The Mission Always Wins," um, and the chat. The problem is the tendency, tendency we have to want to please all of our stakeholders. Um, so uh, Raul Heifetz and Marty Linsky, have, who wrote about adaptive leadership, have famously said that leadership is disappointing your own people at a rate they can absorb. So he's, he's facing it. Matter of fact, I, I had a coaching call with him and his senior staff yesterday. And he said, you know, we've made so many changes. It's so hard. 
the more deeper we get into this, the more we talk about like discipling people to reach their neighbors, we're going to have to stop doing some things. Like, like we don't have the big massive staff, staff we had before. I mean, they still got a bigger staff than most churches in the country, let's be clear. About that. But they, we don't have the ability to solve this problem with just money and staffing. We're going to have to make some decisions. How do we decide what we're going to stop doing so we have time to develop our people for the mission that God's given us? And I always say, your mission and your mission statement is about decision making. So, uh, so when I, when I coach people, we say, "Look, think the decision is related to incision. You haven't made a decision until you've decided where you're going to cut away." And when most people think about a mission statement, what they actually think about is what we call a motto, something we want to inspire people with, like, you know, reaching every generation for Christ. A mission statement is actually much more precise, and it really is about making decisions. And once we're clear, this is our mission. This is what we're about. We're about deploying Christians into a diverse community to engage our neighbors for the sake of the transformation of our community and the world. That's what we're about. When they say that, what happens is they have to now make hard decisions. And the answer is not the pastor wins, not the donor wins. The choir doesn't win. The people who bring us the most money don't win. The people who are new don't win. The mission wins. And that's a very hard thing for strong leaders who are who usually got in their position because they're really emotionally intelligent and good at listening to people, figuring out win-win solutions. And this is one of those places where you can Yeah, and you can't. I think, you know, what you said there that, you know, you're going to disappoint your people at the rate that they can absorb. Uh, so... What does that look like? You know, because you can't, I mean, some people are going to take a lot longer process. So change and value systems and, and shifting the culture of a, a community is going to take a a longer period of time because you're they're going to have to absorb change uh, and disappointment. Some people say, okay, let's just break really fast and we're going to disappoint everybody right away and then things fall apart. So what does a, a, a change scenario look like and at the rate that people can absorb? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Because so this is what when we're coaching leaders, we say to them stuff like this. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to work really hard. You're going to discern the future. You're going to pray. You're going to come up. You're going to say, this is what God wants us to do. We all agree to it, right? And you're going to all say, yes, we do. And we're going to all, we've had candid conversations. We disagreed. But now we believe this is what the, the Lord is in this. And so we're going to stack hands and say, here we're going to go. And we're going to walk outside and we're going to announce this as leaders to the people and we're going to invite them to come with us. And they're all going to agree. They're going to go, yes, let's do it. And then they're going to sabotage. Like, then they're not going to show up. Then they're going to start complaining. Then they're going to, like, Ed Britton Friedman was the one who helped us with this. And this is why the one I wrote one of my earlier books. It was really built around the notion that it is normal and natural for people to sabotage. That sabotage is not the bad things evil people do. But sabotage is the normal human things that anxious people do. They're going to be anxious. I'm losing my church. This feels different. I wonder if we're compromising the gospel. This doesn't feel like the church I grew up in. This this isn't why I came here. And they'll sabotage. They'll resist. They'll push back. And what we have to teach good leaders to do is to not push back against the pushback. Instead, to stay calm and to stay connected and to stay the course and pull them by. Which means that what you do with people when they're pushing back and they're angry and they're anxious is you get closer to them and you lead them through their process of transformation. You literally pull them by rather than push them back. And by pulling people by, which is by attuning and inviting them in and continually walking alongside them, over time, those who are going to be mature and those who are motivated by your mission will join you. You will have others who will leave you. You'll have to just then prepare for the casualties that will come. And that's what I was talking to my client about yesterday. He literally said, okay, here it goes. We're going to lose another group of people who are mad at us. And I said, this is why we're here. Why we're here. It's like, do you believe God's spirit is in this? Yes. Do your leaders? Yes. Your team? Yes. Okay. Here it is. And it's it's normal. It's natural. It's to be expected. It is. These last few years have really, everybody's looking through 
a lens of power uh, these days. Like it's all about power dynamics. Who holds the power? Who gets the power? Who doesn't get the power? It's it's all power dynamics everywhere, and people are trying to to center really the victims or the, the people on the margins because a, that is a, a natural course correction. And sometimes I think we this is what I I was talking to my wife last night, and I was wondering how do we how do we center or we actually give voice and power people that haven't had a voice in, in these power dynamics. But in churches, keep Jesus central and Jesus at the center instead of saying we're going to focus all of our time and effort on just these people over here. How do we how do we that's, these power dynamics work? So I think you're you're somebody that hey, you're intelligent. You could you might have something to say on this. <laughs> well, so, so this is a great conversation and it's a really difficult because especially for you, you know, you and I are both you know, middle-class white guys who probably had a lot of Jesus being centered meant people like us got centered, right? Like I always joke that 30 years ago, there was a big church in California who gave me a full ride scholarship to go to seminary because they said, we believe in you and we want you to be able to, to be free to serve the Lord. And they gave me a full ride scholarship and because they did, I had no debt and I was able to even go on and get a PhD. I said, my wife and I had to pay for the PhD. So I had to save up my pennies. And then and I said, I took a four-year PhD and I had to cram that into nine years because I couldn't afford, you know, to, to do it fast. But I wouldn't have been able to do it at all without the other church giving me the scholarship. And the reason why people like me, I'm 60 and I've got a PhD and I've been able to serve in larger contexts. The reason why people like me are at the top of the food chain in a lot of orgs is that 30 years ago, I fit the bill of what a leader looked like. Today, we have a much more diverse world. And so when we start asking ourselves, what does the future of the church look like? It looks more like the global South. And it looks more like the immigrant church and the, a multicultural church and the Latino church and the African American church and the Asian American. Like it looks, it's not a matter of saying, oh, we're trying to do something political. It's a matter of saying, we're actually looking at Revelation and realizing that. We are in a day where we can see every tribe and nation. So now, that being true, now we got to ask, who makes the decisions? And how do you make them? How do you stay centered on Jesus, who is Lord of all? And we're not. And so for me, I think of it this way. Here's the simplest way I think of this. Power has a, has a purpose. The purpose of power is to stop evil. So you use power to stop what's bad, but power cannot transform. You can't make someone be more loving, be more caring, be more Christ-like. If so, that's why God gives us the capacity to choose God or not, to say yes to God or not. So power has the ability to stop evil. Leadership needs to influence people to be transformed. And so more and more, we need to say, wherever we have power and voice, we need to make sure that evil stops, that we stop the thing that, uh, that's harming. But we can't assume that power can transform people. So uh, power, or we sometimes call it like technical competence, like doing the things that we're authorized to do builds trust. But you invest trust in transformation. There's no transformation without trust, but trust is not transformation. And that requires leaders to now have to, to, to lead beyond power into transformation, which is this different way of, of taking people through their own learning and losses, as we talked about before. Yeah, man. I think that's crucial and necessary and really good. Uh, you know, your, your third book in there is Invest in Transformation, right? Um, and so it says quit relying on trust. Now, trust, it says trust for transformation, right? I mean, your subtitle, quit relying on trust, trust is really difficult because we need trust, uh, but we can't stay at trust. And I think that's what a lot of people are trying to do right now is to stay at trust. So what is out of trust? So now we have a trusting, we're like, okay, this is where God is leading. These are the values that we're going to hold. We trust one another like we... we 
Everybody has a voice. We see each other. Okay. Now what does transformation into the next phase, into the new thing look like? Yeah. Very often transformation, which is how I think about adaptive leadership, transformation starts in two places. It starts when you say, we've done everything we can. We've done, we have done it as best as we can. We've been people of integrity. We've been people of competence. We build trust. You trust me. So if I, you're my pastor, I look at you and I go, I trust you, Joshua. So we have this complicated world. What should we do? A really good leader who knows that they can't rely on trust says the three hardest words for anybody to say, I don't know. And I'm inviting you to come with me on a journey of learning. We're going to figure it out together. We're going to listen to people. We're going to discern the spirit. We don't have a magic bullet. We don't have a solution worked out. We're going to learn as we go. We can't predict the future. So we're going to prototype. We're going to experiment. We're going to learn. So adaptive leadership, trust the transformation, means looking at somebody in the eye and saying, trust me that we will learn our way through this and we will keep going. But I don't have a solution for you. We're just going to have to figure it out. We're going to have to trust our integrity, our character, our, our ability to learn. And the second thing is we're probably going to have to let some things go. So if you came this far in a canoe and you're now facing the Rocky Mountains, to quote my first book, you're going to have to drop that canoe. And I sit, I mean, literally, I go around the world now saying to people the question, so what's the canoe? What's the thing that got you this far? You know, it's my, my friend at the church. What got us this far? We are a church that believes strongly. We preach the Bible. We teach the scriptures. We're not going to give up teaching the scriptures. But we're also not going to build a church for a homogeneous environment that no longer exists. So we're going to have to. So part of what we're dropping is some of our personal comfort so that we can reach neighbors who are different than us. It's going to require us to stretch and humility. It's learning and loss almost every time learning. It's a lot of learning and loss. And, and what you're, you're saying is that somebody is accepting a collaborative leadership style. That is not just a, a top leader saying, I'm going to, you know, preach the vision and you just come follow me and we're going to get it done. It's collaborative. So I want to know in this collaborative space. So if we're moving towards collaboration, uh, what's the role of charisma? and a leader because there's a lot of charismatic people and I don't want to lose somebody's charisma, but I also don't want to rely on charisma. Um, so what's the role of, of charisma in a leader? So say, Hey, I know that I could get people to follow me very quickly and easily <laughs> with a great speech. Uh, what do they have to do, um, in this space? Yeah, yeah, and so, so you know, I um, I teach doctor uh, doctoral seminars, so I have doctoral students. I have now, uh, I just had another cohort, and I have now over a hundred and five doctoral students or graduates who are all people who have been uh, studied and worked on adaptive leadership, like this where we are. Every single one of them was one of those good leaders. Those, you know, and one of the things that good leaders are is they're usually people who someone identified them as a leader and said, "People trust you. People will follow you. You're smart." You're engaging, you're warm, you're chariz charismatic, you can cast a vision. Now, that is all technical competence. It all builds trust. Now, you actually have to take them on a journey that you're going to lead through transformation, which literally means I'm going to have to learn and face loss. So a charismatic leader becomes no less charismatic, but they do become more humble and more collaborative. Oftentimes, they become better listeners than speakers. They become better coaches than star players. Um, like it really is a shift, right? And um, and you know, I, to be honest, it was one of the shifts I had to face as a person who was called into senior leadership at 33, and after you know 10 years of leadership, all the metrics going up into the right, I realized I was facing this crisis because while the metrics were going up, the morale was going down, and I did not know what to do. And I had to learn to lead all over again. That's how I ended up last year. Yeah. I think, you know, one of the things that we have seen through the pandemic and through this change is that the church thought that they were really good disciple makers. Um, and they realized that 
maybe we weren't very good at disciple making and discipleship. Uh, maybe we were good at other things. Um, what does what does discipleship look like in the midst of, of change and loss, growth, transformation, moving towards change? Oh, uh, Joshua, I'm, at the moment, I'm so glad you said it, not me. But you just said, you said that I think the single biggest pain in the church right now is that, you know, the, the, all the numbers aren't in and all the studies aren't in and we won't know for a couple of decades. But basically the indicators of this, this could be the first cri- global crisis that the church didn't grow. I mean, going back to like the time of Jesus, like when you read the early church, every time Rome had a plague, the church grew. Every time we've had wars, the church grows. Like people come, they they seek God and they seek God in these communities of people who are living very differently with different values. You know, you had people who had like, you know, the Black Plague who were literally nursing people back to health at their own expense. And it became a witness. In this coronavirus and all the things we've had, the political stuff that's swirling and everything else, the church has begun to plummet. While there's some individual churches that are doing well, the statistics are just, whew, it's daunting how many people we lost. And what we're realizing is we were not as Christian as we thought we were. We were asked to love our neighbors and we thought about trying to give hope and reach people with the gospel and depend on Christ. And what we did is we hunkered down, got mad, and relied on politics. And it just divided, and especially soured younger generations. Uh, 45 and younger, those folks have become cynical about the church. And I'm part of that older generation that needed to be inspiring them, and we didn't. So now we have a crisis in discipleship that we have to face. And it's only going to start by telling the truth that our old best practices, all the things we thought were discipleship, didn't work. Yeah. We have this great skit as we're training missionaries to go out. And uh, the, one of the characters in the skit is old ways. And uh, and so and then somebody, you know, they actually go into it's a whole skit around Pentecost and like what's happening in new things. But the but what it is, is like people have been relying on the old ways. What is the the change? What's the new thing? So as we we just saw the crack in the foundation of we're not as Christian as we thought we were. Uh, discipleship isn't there. There's cynicism, uh, people under 45. What's it going to, what do you think? I, I, I don't want to, so there's no silver bullets. We know that. So <laughs> and we don't know exactly what's going to happen. So because it's uncertain and we're moving into a future that looks totally drastically different than it did before. What's it going to take? What are the the core competencies for people leading in this space so that we can move in a different direction and actually build a foundation that won't crack? Yeah. So I had a coach say to me once in, in these words that are just reverberate. I use them over and over again. He says to me, when what you're doing is not working. So we're all paused and we said, look, the way we were discipling people pre-pandemic didn't work. I, mean, I had a I had a pastor say to me, um, pastor of a multi site mega church in the South, say to me, after thirty four years of pastoral congregation, I wonder if I if I wasted my life. My people were vile to each other over politics and the pandemic and such. Like it wasn't working. If what you're doing is not working, there are two things you cannot do. You cannot do nothing. You can't just sit here and say, okay, God will, God will provide. God will take care of it. I'm doing nothing. Um, God always calls us to be co-collaborators. With you, and you cannot do what you've always done. You can't say, okay, you know what we're going to do? We're going to double down on our old programs. And we're going to really mean it this time. And we're going to, you know, instead of memorizing the Bible in a year, we're going to memorize the Bible in half a year. Like, you know, like you can't, you can't try harder, right? So what you do is you actually start that humble process of learning. So one of the things I, one of the biggest things that almost all my clients and all my students are working on is what does it look like to rethink the practices of discipleship and spiritual formation to prepare people for a world of constant change? We didn't prepare them for that world. So because of it, now we have to rethink that. 
And anybody who tells you they have a solution, I just doubt. I just doubt. I just doubt anybody's got it. I, I'm way more interested in people who are humbly experimenting and trying things and learning. You learn your way forward. You let go of things. And you find yourself uh, starting into some new new areas. Some new All right. We need those experimenters to rise up. We need people to iterate something new and try, fail, move forwards, uh, and that they could help us move into a better future for us. I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. One of the things, I, I mean, I, I know some people who grew up in a chaotic home growing up. They faced abuse or neglect. And what they really enjoy is <laughs> calm and peace and and clarity of like, this is what life will be. Now we're in a place where it's constant change. And so they're not very high on adaptability. So for people that aren't very high on adaptability, that want this, this certainty which will never get certainty, to be honest. But if they want this this place where it's calm, presence, is there a way to be calm in the midst of change and you're not highly adaptable? And how do you walk leaders through if they're in that position? Yeah, yeah, it's such a great question because we're so aware, aren't we, of trauma and the effects of it and of being in chaotic environments and being in chaotic families. I mean, we're just more aware of it than ever. So this is what I say to people. Um, so... First of all, you're normal to want that. It makes every sense. Like that is the longing of our hearts, right? We look forward to the day when the lion will lay down with the lamb, when there will be no longer any tears or death or mourning. We we are made, we long for that. And when we get glimpses of it, it's like heaven on earth, isn't it? Right? All your kids are home around the table and you're laughing and you're eating a meal and, and all of a sudden you realize you can't get a bite of food out because you're crying because this is the most beautiful thing you can imagine. Like this is what we long for. This is normal. This is right. And it is also not permanent. We live in a year, we live in a world where it's not yet there. So we tell people you want certainty and I can't give you certainty, but what I can give you is clarity. I can say, look, here's what's true that we know to be true. And here's where we're headed because we're committed to it. And here are our values that will not change. And those things don't feel like much because they're, there are three pretty small things in the chaotic world. So when people come to the church and say, I just want the church to be the one calm place in my life, I say to them, the church is like a boat that was meant for the sea. It's calm when it's in the, when it's in the harbor but it wasn't made to stay in the harbor. So we'll have these moments and we don't, and we want to get rid of as much dysfunction as we possibly can internally. We want the, we want everybody on the ship to be aligned, but we're heading to the storms. Ships were made for the storm. They were made for the voyage. So come with me. We're going to do our best. And when the storms come, we're going to cling to each other. We can be clear that we are committed to each other, but we cannot be certain about what's in front of us. And I can't, I can't promise you that. Uh, so that's, that's clear. So it could be clear for people and it's cl being clear is kind, right? It's kind to, to people. So we could be clear and we could say, I don't know. You said that earlier. It's a very difficult thing to say is I don't know. And when you, ha you are leading a place and you say, I don't know people, some people are going to go, well, I'm out then. Like I need somebody who knows <laughs> what, so then how do you how do you bring people along when you say I don't know in this the space can you br bring people along or are they just like okay I need to go find a, a different leader Yeah I always tell leaders there's two things you should be aware of at that moment one is your job is to grow cl go closer to them go closer to the people you cannot give them certainty but you can give them the clarity that you are connected to them I will be with you. I will be with you. Like it's like I used to tell my kids sometimes when we were uh, doing some scary things like backpacking or skiing or something. Like that. I can't guarantee you that you're going to get down this thing well, but I will be right next to you. We will be here. We stay connected to each other. And we use deep connection as a way to, to give ourselves courage and strength all the way through. But there also will be casualties. 
There will be people who will say, I don't want to go. And there is nothing we can do. There, you're going to have people who are going to, when I was talking to my client, you know, who said, oh my gosh, we're going to make this decision. We're going to lose more people. And I went, you probably are. There's probably folks who are just going to be disappointed and they're going to leave. Je- Jesus faced it, right? Jesus, I mean, Jesus feeds the 5,000 and the crowds grow and they're all excited and he takes them across the lake and a bigger crowd comes and he says, I'm not going to feed you this time because you came for the bread and I want you to hear the word. And people got mad because they came for the tuna sandwich. They didn't come for the preaching. And when the disciples are mad at him, like we're finally getting finally getting traction and you're making people go away and he looks at the disciples and he says to them are you gonna leave me too and what i love is peter who gets to be the guy he says where else are we gonna go i mean like you're the one with the words of eternal life we know you're the truth but we're not happy about it is how we'll translate it and i think i think we have to do that a lot with people i think we just have to get close to them stay connected to them stay calm and know that when we stay the course, there's going to be casualties. We're going to treat them well as best as we possibly can. That that brings us back into you know trust, transformation, those sort of things. So, so that trust and the connection. I know that this is trust is one of the hardest things to to come by through the pandemic because you know the, the politics, everything you know broke us. We were unkind to each other. Trust. Is there is there a difference to say that trust will lead to transformation? How we build it is there a, is there a difference between trust leading to transformation, building it differently than just trust for trust's sake? Yeah, yeah. So um, it's a really good question. Most of us think trust for trust's sake is enough. If we can if we can raise the level of trust, we'd be better. And sure enough, if you're a leader, say of a church or, or a mission agency or something, and, and people trust you, you probably get job security out of it, right? You, and like you know, the problem, however, is that's not your point. That's like stay. That's like a boat staying in the harbor. Your, your purpose is the journey, so you have to build the trust so you can take people through the transformation. And what it means is, is when we hit those hard moments, what they trust is they trust my character because they know I love them and care care for them and I'm doing with them. And they trust my competence. They trust that I, I'm doing the best I can, including learning as fast as I can, listening to people along the way, like being open to the fact that I need to be corrected. And so you can trust that we'll figure it out. And there's actually, you know, it's a, there's a deep dive you can do on how emotionally, psychologically, that's how trust is built. It's actually built you know, between a mother and a baby. When the baby cries and the mother can't read the baby's mind and they got to stay there with the baby crying until they finally get it right. Like, oh, it's not a poopy diaper. It's not that you're hungry. It's you want to be covered. Over time, the baby grows in trust for the mother because they trust that over time, we will work this out together. And I think that's what we need more in the church. Over time, we will work this out together. Beautiful. I love that. You know, you mentioned... Uh, earlier, yeah, through this process, we want to be clear on our mission, move forward, and it's not just an inspirational statement, but it's you know what we're doing. So then, what is a bad mission? What's a bad mission statement? And then, how do we get more clarity in our mission? Yeah. So we always say most mission statements are bad because they're not mission statements; they're mottos. You know, they're too general. They're meant like, what is the mission statement's purpose? The purpose is we want something we can all rally around or we want, I I tell people like a good mission statement is a tool. It's not a t-shirt. It's not something that you like rock the t-shirt because I want to tell everybody about my church or my organization. I just bought an organization I support um, uh, that is basically in favor of river reclamation where I live. And I bought one of their hats because I want them to know, right? They got a good motto. I I want to be, I want to wear it tool or mission statement is a tool for decision making and so one of the exercises we teach in the book um, you know that, that the mission always wins is how to write an eight word mission statement eight words that's all you get and what the what's important is you get a group of people together who are going to work on that and so getting down to eight words and the right eight words and the words that define who we are verb target impact or start with the target. Who are we called to reach? What is the reason for us? What's the impact we're going to have? What's the difference we want to make? Why are we here? 
And then what is the verb, the action that is the center of what we do? And it's not everything, but it's the center. It's the tip of the spear. It's the center of the target. And when you get clear on that, everything else reverberates from that or it goes away. And so like in my little company, we got it down to seven words. We said, we're going to show off. But, but the whole point was you don't have 42. And I tell pastors all the time that no fair hyphenating lots of words, like just get really clear, like a clear, like a sharp knife that you can gently and clearly cut through and make decisions over. And that's, that's a, it's, it's a whole, we, we have a whole workshop where we teach people in a day how to work on that. Thing. It's a, it's, it's work, but it is really transformative. Mm, I think it's, that is good. I'm just reflecting on my own organization's mission statement. We have two verbs and we have an impact and then like why and then where. So it is a little longer than eight words, but because we have the where statement at the end. Um, so, but we have these, so they're, I mean, the two verbs are train leaders and make disciples. So they're, they're two different different things. So one, I'm training leaders to actually go and make disciples. And then we want people to be disciple makers wherever they live, work and play. And they're actually doing that. So when you have a mission statement, so I have now two verbs. Now, if I'm making decisions in this crazy world of change, like some people are going to gravitate towards the the train part. Some are going to gravitate towards the make part. Um, so how do you how do you deal with that? Is there like, hey, is that too disparate of ideas, even though one leads to another? Um, or is it something where, yeah, some people could gravitate towards one, some towards the other? So so this is the way I would say this is whenever you have more than one thing, which sometimes happens, this, like the question is, is this right? We can't get, we cannot reduce it any further. This is as sharp as we can make it. If we think it is, then let's ask this question. Um, what would happen if we put one of them over the others? We have two priorities. So let's just say which one is the most important. So, so, and that's really hard because you have two groups of people who care about both. If your whole reason is holding people together, then you're said, then are actually, we have a bigger reason for existing, which is to hold a group of people together around these two things. So it's not, it's not wrong. It's, and when I tell people eight words, sometimes people go, well, we got it down to 10. It's not 400 and it's not 14, right? It's get it as sharp as you need to. And if there's two things to do, so I'll give you an example. Um, I work in a seminary. If you ask almost any university or institution, they would say most of them have basically two purposes for a university or something. It is one is to do research and scholarship. So one is scholarship and the other one is students, scholarship and students. Sometimes they go together very, very well in many ways. That's, a, that's an ecosystem that works really well. But on occasion, you have to make decisions. So what's more important? That we draw good scholars or that we put first our students? And then you have competing values. And one of the parts about adaptive change is it's not only learning and loss. The third one is you have to, it reveals competing values that have to be na navigated. So with two parts of a mission statement, you often then have to navigate competing values based on something else that is even more important than even the two parts. And that's the question. That's usually the pain point or the people you're serving, right? If you ask. So in our seminary, we say, what does the church need most from this? First, it needs us to both do scholarship and it, to serve students. But what's our primary responsibility? And that changes the time. Fuller was really, hey, we're established church growth movement. We're established world evang evangelization. Like we're we're moving towards a certain thing. Is there something that Fuller has learned over time when the world has shifted and changed to say, hey, some of these these principles that we thought were the things that we needed to do actually is not serving the world right now. Is there a way, uh, how, how has Fuller shifted and change in a changing world? Yeah. Well, so I'll, so I'll, I'll be glad to answer it um, a little, with a little bit of historical piece. So I've been out of senior leadership now for three years. So I do not want to speak for the current senior leadership, but for the better part of seven years, I was 
the, one of the VPs in, in our system. In other systems, I would have been a senior VP. I was a division head for with the president. And we were working on this all the time, all the time. We were asking ourselves the question, what is the core uh, purpose that Bowler serves? We serve the church. We serve the global church of Jesus Christ. And what do we offer? And there's no doubt that our scholarship is part of it. I got a PhD from it, from Fuller. But it's also no doubt that it's the global church and a changing church. And there are even things we did in the past that were technical solutions that worked for a time that we have researched our way through and we no longer use. That's part of our learning. So every institution, every organization has to keep refocusing itself based on its core mission and on the chain and the people are trying to serve. And in a changing church, seminaries have got to be very adaptive. And frankly, most of us, I mean, let's face it, most people who were trained at a seminary were not trained to be very adaptive. They were trained to get tenure. You know, I would say tenure gets you security and it gives you autonomy. We need a lot more collaboration and, you know, exploration. So it's it's a it's a heavy lift. And I really admire my colleagues for working. Yeah, that's great. That's wonderful. Uh, I thought I that was just uh, an interesting thought thinking through like a a very influential uh, institution for the the global church and to think through what does a, an influential institution do when the world shifts and changes and how does that start to lead out and adapt and change and grow as the the world does and we learn more and we we grow into different things um, so. That's good. That's great. Um, what did you learn through the pandemic that what kind of pastors were we making <laughs> that they now a lot of are like, hey, I'm going to leave. I'm going to do something different. Um, this isn't what I signed up for. I'm here. What what are were some of those those things that pastors were holding on to that when change happened, they didn't like it. They were done. Like, I don't know how to lead through this. So there's there's two, there's, it's a big question. It's a really big question. And, and it's, it's probably as different as every pastor. But I would say that in just giant sweeps, I would say that the two biggest things that most pastors got in touch with during the pandemic is I was trained to be a preacher teacher. Like I was trained to teach the scriptures, preach the Bible, communicate that if I can teach and preach well, that that's what I mostly needed to do. And people who preached and we, we, and we could preach really, really well, could build big movements, right? And build big churches. Then others were taught, um, I'm really trained to care well. Like I'm a pastor, I'm a shepherd. And we thought that preaching and pastoral care could be enough. And some of our churches said, well, we had to add programs. Like we're good at that too. So preaching, pastoral care, and programs. That that there's our those are our tricks. Those are our those are our superpowers. We're really good at that. All of a sudden we got into a world where um, not everybody believed or, or or wanted to listen to the scriptures in the same way. We couldn't get close to people to care for them the way we wanted to. And most programs that used to work stopped working. So what you end up with, going back to where we started, is pastors who are just doubling down on trying harder with things that aren't working. I said, it's like paddling a canoe when there's no water in the river. You're just going to burn out your rotator cuff, right? You're just going to exhaust yourself. And so part of what we needed to do is say to, say to pastors, to be a pastor, which is to listen to your people and lead them to where God wants to take them together as a community that forms them on the journey. I think you're you're, you're taking people through the wilderness to the promised land. You're, you're taking people through, you know, the world to to be to the new kingdom, new creation. It's going to require you to have a different set of skills. You're still going to preach. You're still going to pastor. You're still going to create some programs, but you're you're going to have to actually think about how you lead differently. And most of us weren't prepared for that. We were not prepared. We were not taught to be a pastor and to be a mission leader. Yeah. Um, so if people go out, get this practicing change series, which they should, it's great. What was your, what is your hope for people that would walk through this practicing change series? Yeah, actually, I love that question because I had a very specific, when I talked to my publisher about it, they said, you know, what do you want? I, I just got back 
from being in Bangkok with a group of leaders in from World Vision. And I were and and along the way home as we were traveling, I, there was this remarkable leader who was doing training in for World Vision in, in micro lending. They just do this remarkable work. And I thought to myself, you know, when I got to Los Angeles, she's going to keep going on to Houston and I'm going to go home. And I thought to myself, I so am so inspired by leaders like her. This is what I want. If she stepped into an airport store and she got a bottle of Excedrin and a water bottle and a power bar and she picked up my little book, she could read it between Los Angeles and Houston on the plane in like two and a half hours. And she could then buy 10 copies and give it to her team. And they could all talk about it on Wednesday, right? Like, so what I want for these books is I want these books to be poured over. I want them to be, they are built with illustrations and questions and group activities. I mean, they're meant to be like a, a manual field guide for a leader trying to help their team um, develop these capacities. And, and that's, and then the, I'd say, then, you know, whatever, whatever the challenges you face, pick up one, read it, you go through it, take your team through it and start practicing it. Excellent. Excellent. I hope people do that. I th it's fantastic. It's really good. Um, so how can people go out and get these books? How can they connect with you? Where would you like to point people to? Yeah. So our, uh, the website of my company is A.E. Sloan, S-L-O-A-N, A.E. Sloan Leadership.com, A.E. Sloan Leadership.com. And if folks find that or can put a note to it, right there on the front of our website, there's a click where you can purchase the books and it'll take you, it'll get, help you get books for yourself, your team, whatever you want. Like it's, it's there on our website, aeslawleadership.com. And um, it's, it, I've got a great team working for it right now. It's just great. Great. So go to aeslawleadership.com and go and get these, these books. Uh, yeah, you're doing some fantastic work and you're helping us move into a, a new world and that, you know, Hey, almost 20 years ago, maybe 2000, you were like, Hey, <laughs> the world is different. We need to focus on change, adaptive leadership. And now we're we're in the thick of it. And so you've been leading the way for a long, long time. So thank you for your work and what you've been doing. I have one really quick question at the end. What is one memory of catching a fish in the stream, the river, that you could remember that it was just monumental for you? Actually, it's so interesting because I actually tell the story in one of the books about spending an entire day with a guy, a, a guide who just broke down my cast. He like I had I had twenty years of bad habits, and it was a whole. I mean, we caught a lot of fish, but I was exhausted. You know, it's like when people like me criticizing you and helping you get better. And so I was exhausted at the end of the day. The next day, I went out on the river, love my home river, and I caught the biggest river on that fish I'd ever caught. Because the guy that I, the day before, had broken down my cast. And he literally, like, I found myself in his little voice in my head going, do this, do this, do this, boom. And to this day, I think that's the experience I want others to have when I, when I help them. Like, it might be hard to go through the coaching, but you're going to have this experience that you never, that you wouldn't have had before. And I literally had it on the river. I literally had it on the river. That's so awesome. That's so good. Well, Todd, thank you for this conversation. It was fantastic. I think it's going to help a lot of people. So uh, yeah, go and again, go get Todd's series, the whole book, Practice Change. And then hey, if you haven't gotten Canoe in the Mountains or Tempered Resilience or any of his other books, go and get those as well. Uh, they're thank fantastic. You. So thank you so much for this conversation, Todd. My, my pleasure. Really, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you want to see more episodes like this, go to patreon.com slash shifting culture and become a monthly patron of the show. You can help us produce more episodes so that we can see the body of Christ look more like Jesus. If you become a patron on patreon.com slash shifting culture, uh, you will get early access to episodes. You will get episode guides. You will get bonus shows, hopefully, and more. So go to patreon.com slash shifting culture and become a monthly patron. Also leave a rating and review on Apple podcasts. Uh, it really helps us out and helps us find new listeners to the show and just go and share this podcast with your friends, your family, your network, people that you think would enjoy it as well. Thank you 
again for listening to the show. I hope you have a great week.